If somebody said, what's the mission of all of our universities? Mission, right? I'm on, this is cool fact. We use the term mission very precisely. Mission is the why. It's the deep why. So when people say our mission, I sometimes still hear this. Our mission is research, teaching, and service, public service. I disagree. Those are profoundly important hows. But the why is impact, long-term societal benefit. The deep why is long-term societal benefit. All right. So now, let me just call that impact. The deep why is impact. To what use are you going to put your university, whoever you are, wherever you are, to what use? How are you going to deliver on your why? How are you going to deliver impact? Framed that way, I think all of us could look at this and say, of course, this is mission advancing, as opposed to it's a sideshow, it's distracting, it's commercial, it's not supporting our mission. It's like, no, our mission is impact. Hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world are working to improve life and address imminent threats to humanity. Often their research ends up in the scientific valley of death in the form of publications and patents that never see the light of day. That is about to change. Welcome to the Lab to Startup podcast, hosted by Naresh Sankara, founder and executive director of the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneurship Program at the University of California, Berkeley. This show has two main goals. Share the stories of those who have successfully founded startups based on their own research and highlight resources needed to help those aspiring to launch startups in the deep tech space. Whether it's electric cars, vaccines, addressing climate change concerns, or possibly establishing life on other planets, Naresh and his esteemed guests want to help scientists, engineers, faculty, and researchers bring their innovations to market. Learn more and subscribe today at labtostartup.com. And now, here's Naresh. My guest today is Richard Lyons, the Associate Vice Chancellor and Chief Innovation and Entrepreneurship Officer at the University of California, Berkeley. Rich is an economist and the former Dean of the Business School. It was recently announced that Rich will become the next Chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley. At the time when Rich agreed to be a guest on my show, we didn't know of this news. So... This is an extra special episode for me as I talk to the next chancellor. We talk about a wide variety of topics around the evolution of innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem at UC Berkeley. We covered topics like paradigm shifts, cultural transformations, overcoming inertia, global impact, and many others. I moved here in 2009 for my postdoc, and I've personally seen a tremendous growth of the startup ecosystem, especially around technology translation. You can check out some of the conversations I had previously with leaders like Doug Crawford, Amy Herr, Rich Kelly, and Dave Schaefer, where we covered parts of that story. And now I felt a need to tell the bigger story about this evolution. And I couldn't think of anyone better than Rich Lyons to have this conversation with. I hope you get some insights from the story and walk away with appreciation and potentially actionable steps if you're trying to build some startup ecosystems on your campuses. Well, Rich, I have to start by congratulating you on being appointed as the next chancellor for UC Berkeley. This is super exciting news. Thank you. Thank you. Because you've been at Berkeley for such a long time, over four decades, from getting your undergrad here to becoming a faculty at the business school, it's been now the chancellor. I believe you have an advantage and also unique perspectives about the evolution of university, especially around its innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. Can you talk about the most significant paradigm shifts that happened over the past, say, two decades that catalyzed the growth of UC Berkeley startup ecosystem? Yeah, happy to. And thanks for the opportunity, Naresh. And thanks for all your leadership on campus as well. So that's a big question. I grew up in the South Bay, went to Los Altos High School. My family's not connected to the tech industry, but I had friends whose parents were part of Fairchild Semiconductor and so forth. I didn't know what was up back then, but there was a lot going on, obviously. So I think some of this is sort of in my blood. So paradigm shifts, when we think about some of the elements of that, well, I'll mention two more recent things. I can go back further if you like, but there was a 2018 report. It's actually posted on the web if people want to find it. It's called the Report on Entrepreneurship at UC Berkeley. If you search that phrase, report on entrepreneurship at UC Berkeley. And it was a faculty-driven report. 
And it talks about tech transfer and, you know, do we have as many staff as other universities? But it also actually mentions the creation of my current role. So as you mentioned, I oversee innovation and entrepreneurship on the Berkeley campus. And my role didn't exist back in 2018. That report is part of what created it. And like so many universities, Berkeley has choose centralization. So my job got created with no power, no authority, no budget, <laughs> but tremendous coordination opportunities, which is how do we make it all add up to more than some of the parts? That's kind of my job description. Anyways, that report was a watershed. I'll call it a paradigm shift. And then in May of 2021, the University of California Regents, UC Regents, published a report, a task force report on innovation, transfer, and entrepreneurship across the whole UC system. And Normally, we think about one or two levels up of governance for a university. It's like, boy, they're just so far away. I mean, they're always behind us and we're always wanting to do stuff they don't want us to do. Well, that report was remarkable. It had 14 very specific recommendations for these campuses to move faster. And I'm talking faster than some campuses were ready to move. And that's really remarkable when you have that kind of wind in your sails. And I'll mention real quickly two more elements of the paradigm shift. One is CRISPR and applied biology. Jennifer Dowden, applied biology, the idea that we're getting more and more into translation it was a culture shifter by itself. And then a fourth one, rather, that goes back a little further. I'll just call it app platform. The app platforms, machine learning, now AI, there's a whole category of opportunities there that didn't exist when we go back 25 plus years. You touched upon so many subjects. I promise I will go down a lot of these threads down the conversation. But you mentioned about the 2018 report and recommendations. What prompted that? Any background to that? I think what really prompted it was we had a provost at the time, Paul Alavisados was his name. He ran Lawrence Berkeley Lab, but more importantly, he was a serial entrepreneur himself. And he's now president of the University of Chicago. Terrific scholar, chemist, terrific person. He could see the headroom in this opportunity. And I think he was the one who basically said, we need a report like that to galvanize some change. Faculty were leading it, as I mentioned. I want to tip my hat to Paul. I think that was really fundamental. He could see headroom that a lot of people at the time weren't seeing as much of. Paul was a great mentor. You mentioned about starting those groups, faculty groups and student groups. And I was leading the student effort on campus at that point, but he's definitely a great visionary. Thank you for that. When I came to Berkeley for my postdoc in 2009, at that point, a lot was talked about how Stanford was number one school for entrepreneurship. And I always wondered like how Stanford got where it did. One answer I got again and again was about the culture. And now that you see Berkeley is on the top, can you talk about the cultural transformation that happened in going to that number one spot at Berkeley? Thanks for that. Number one spot and top spots, I guess we're number one in one very specific way. The pitch book data over the last year showed that we were number one at creating venture funded startups. So we're number one in the number of venture funded startups that we create over the last 10 years, which is their time window. So anyways, thanks for mentioning that. The culture question is really so fundamental. If somebody said, you pick one thing that was culturally transforming in the direction of innovation and entrepreneurship at Berkeley, and you only get one, I would call, we created a category of translation fellows. It's a category of translational research fellows. It's called the B-A-K-A-R Fellows Program, Baker Fellows Program. And it is a program that funds research, translational research, with an eye toward commercialization. And we'd never had anything like that on campus. Paul Olivasados, I think, was provost when that got started as well. And the idea was, this is important. This is mission advancing for Berkeley, folks. You should all participate. It's been running some 10 years. Six, seven of these faculty fellows, these Baker fellows, are picked every year. It's translational research. And it's celebrated. And it's at scale. A couple hundred thousand dollars a year for three years. The terms have changed over time. It allows some experiments downstream. I want to emphasize this. If somebody said, Jennifer Doudna, why are you taking Jennifer Doudna away from fundamental research? She's, you know, arguably the best or among the best, very best thinkers in her field, which is true. It's sort of like, well, we have postdocs. You were a postdoc here. We have graduate students. The faculty are involved as well. But the idea that this translational interest is making us weaker at fundamental research, I disagree with that statement. I think it makes us stronger 
at fundamental research. We can talk about that. So anyways, I think people started to recognize that that trade-off really wasn't there, that this was mission advancing for Berkeley and is likely to make us even stronger at fundamental research. Yeah, yeah. I mean, speaking of that, translational fellows, is it meant for faculty or what was the intended? It was the first 10 years. I don't remember. We've run about 10 now, a little over 10. It was very faculty focused. So research faculty focused. So what we call Senate faculty, you know, the tenure line faculty. They have since created a separate track for graduate students. And I think postdocs are included in that. So they actually added a track of funding for graduates, for doctoral students to support translational research. I asked that question because historically speaking, academia has been perceived as somewhat disconnected from the entrepreneurial world. And how did that transformation occur in its culture and the mindset to embrace entrepreneurship? I'm asking for specifics more because I think the universities and academia hasn't changed much in the US, talking about. I'm trying to see like what others can walk away with this in terms of cultural transformations happening here at Berkeley. If somebody said, what are you obsessed with? I would say I'm obsessed with culture, the formation of culture, how leaders help to shape culture and form culture. I mean, it's an area that I've actually done some writing in, and I'm very, very interested in. And I love the question. There's no simple answer to this, as you suggest. But the fact that the provost of the university, himself a great scholar, is leading on this translational fellows program, this Baker fellows program, that sent a hell of a signal to people. The idea that this is mission advancing for Berkeley, So to have that tone from the top sending that message, that's sort of, I'll call it a lever. That's lever number one. Tone from the top was unambiguous and I think very, very clear. A second element was if somebody said, you keep calling it mission advancing, how is it mission advancing? I think people, especially now, but even back then, the idea is, are all the benefits of this, the returns to Berkeley, the cash flows, if if I can use that phrase, those financial inflows, Are they all accruing to, you know, engineering and chemistry and the humanities get nothing and the core of the university is unfunded? No. People are starting to say generating resources, big chunks of which are going to be unrestricted, is part of how you power a great and comprehensive research university. In other words, there is alignment in our interests as a large faculty, the whole faculty. And people are really starting to get that as well. But you have to point it out. You actually have to link and label, as they say, so that people can start to see, okay, this money is getting spent more widely. And I'll just mention one other quick thing. We created a website. There's a memo that was, I'm going to say it was 2021 or 2022. It was a memo from the system-wide provost. So this is the 10 campus provost of the UC system, Provost Brown. And it went to all of the chancellors. And it said, from now on, in our academic personnel manual, activity on behalf of our faculty in innovation and entrepreneurship counts positively toward promotion and tenure. It's like, wow. Mm. Now, just to give you an example, it's sort of like, oh, well, that exists. I posted it on the website. If somebody goes to I-N-E, I-A-N-D-E dot Berkeley dot E-D-U, I-N-E, innovation and entrepreneurship, I need that birthday to you. You will find that memo. I think my hand's going to get slapped. Somebody's going to say, that's not a public memo. It's sort of like, that's how you change culture. You show the world that that memo exists and that the game changed. So part of it is to sum it all up, I've kind of mentioned three different levers. It's intentionality is behind all of it. You either bring intentionality to culture change or it's not going to happen. People really do need to be intentional. Those are great levers, Rich. I would like to double click on the subject of intentionality because this is something I talk about very often on my podcast when it comes to technology translation. Can you elaborate about intentionality, maybe by talking about a specific subject as an example? Yeah, I do believe so. I mean, somebody might say, you have all these advantages, your location, your (laughs) geography. It's like, yeah, it's kind of easy for you to say this, Rich. But let me reframe it a bit. If somebody said, what's the mission of all of our universities? mission, right? I'm on the business school faculty. We use the term mission very precisely. Mission is the why. It's the deep why. So when people say our mission, I sometimes still hear this, our mission is research, teaching, and service, public service. I disagree. Those are profoundly important hows, but the why is impact, long-term societal benefit. The deep why is long-term societal benefit. All right. So now let me just call that in the deep why is in 
To what use are you going to put your university, whoever you are, wherever you are? To what use? How are you going to deliver on your why? How are you going to deliver impact? Framed that way, I think all of us could look at this and say, of course, this is mission advancing, as opposed to it's a sideshow, it's distracting, it's commercial, it's not supporting our mission. It's like, no, our mission is impact. Now, we have to do it with our eyes open. Is there a place too far? Are there things that one could do as a university that people would say, no, this now grates against our values? Of course, that's true. But I think if any university that wants to deliver long-term societal benefit, wants to deliver impact, if that's the deep why, then they will look at this set of activities, translational work, et cetera, and a community-engaged scholarship. It's another domain, more on the social science and humanities side that's developing rapidly. Those are impact vectors. I think impact is a great way to think about mission for academic institutions. A related subject about academic institutions is the inertia to change. Established universities and institutions often face inertia and resistance to change. I personally saw the resistance here at Berkeley, for instance, when postdocs approached the then Vice Chancellor for Research, Graham Fleming, about using some of the empty lab space for startups. The answer was no. He had a good reason. He said, like, one of the reasons we can't do that is because Berkeley is a public university and startups are private entities. And he can be intermingling those things. I'm sure I'm not privy to many of the other challenges. In your observations, what were the initial cultural barriers or mindset challenges faced at Berkeley and to pursue commercialization? A very important on-the-ground type of question when you sort of meet real decisions, right? It's like, oh, you're the shiny objects and you're at 30,000 feet, but it's sort of like you've got a lab. Are you going to allow it to be used this way? And there are lots of reasons to say no. Here's what, something I learned just in the last couple of months, I use it all the time now. Start with yes, if. Start with yes, if. You're having a conversation with people sort of like, the if conditions can be stringent. If we can't meet them, if we can't mitigate them, then the answer is no. But we're starting with yes, if. And let's go through the if conditions. The reason I say that is because often when something like that gets addressed, like can we use unused lab space for this purpose? People will start posing quite legitimately objections. They'll start saying, but what about this? What about that? What about that? And you get five or six or seven of these effectively objections or counter arguments, and nobody uses their creativity to address those counter arguments. You default to no, and you land there and you move on. It's like, I just heard seven good arguments against. But if instead you say, here's if condition number one, could we mitigate that? Oh, that's interesting. I'll just take one example to make this concrete. If somebody said, we are a public university, and those are private companies. And the attorneys will talk about private inurement. That's the legal term. The idea is we're subsidizing with public resources a private concern, right? And that's a legal concern, totally legit. But if we also said, what if we got as compensation, consideration in the legal sense, what if compensation, we could get a safe note in the company that's coming out of it? What if Berkeley got a little piece of the equity that that company is going to produce so that there's actually consideration? That breaks the inurement problem. And it's like, wow, that's really interesting. Safe note. We could solve that. Okay. Are there other issues? Yeah. There's confidentiality. We can't have people walking around Jennifer Dowden's lab and seeing what's going on. Okay. So some resources we could do this with, others we couldn't. All right. But if you walk through the if conditions, you can get to it. Yes. But it takes a leader that starts with a kind of yes, if framework and then mitigates those tough if conditions. I really like that framework of yes, if, which results in exploring possibilities as opposed to shutting down possibilities. This reminds me of some of the most successful venture capitalists like Mike Moritz, who asked the question, how big can this become if it succeeds, as opposed to thinking of failures? And speaking of possibilities, two people come to my mind at Berkeley, Mike Cohen and Carol Mimura, who are always welcoming new ideas by framing them as pilot programs. They actually never shut down any ideas that I brought to them. Instead, they bring the rest of the team to discuss and act on it. I had the opportunity to work with them over the years, and I greatly appreciate that. Which do any such pilot programs come to mind that you consider as game-changing? I love that word. I use that word all the time. <laughs> Mike and Carol, pioneers at using that word. And it's sort of like, you want to get something done in the university because it puts a time frame on things, right? It's sort of like, no, the default is this ends in N years, whatever N is. And that's just a really potent look. Experimentation. 
the world is uncertain. It's ambiguous. It's volatile. Experimentation is the name of the game. We see it in industry. We see it in the public sector, the university sector. We see it in the civic sector. It's like, you better be experimenting. It's evolving way too fast for you to not be running experiments. So when I hear the word pilot, I think experiment. And it's like, it doesn't mean you should run every experiment that's proposed, but experimentation needs to be an MO. So anyways, your question was, give me an example. Here's one. Mike Cohen led a process on campus where we were trying to systematize. You mentioned earlier this idea of using some lab space for a private company. And for example, how do you use lab instruments? We have mass spectrometers. We have a lot of them on campus. They're not utilized that much. If you sort of looked at the percentage utilization of the, I don't know the actual number, the 10 or 15 mass spectrometers on gammas, I think you'd find that on average, they're less than 20%. And they're certainly less than 20% on Sundays and in the middle of the night on a Tuesday. Anyways, Mike, as a pilot proposal, and other people worked on this too, put together a platform that we called the Research Infrastructure Commons, the RIC, the Berkeley RIC, Research Infrastructure Commons. And it basically systematized this. Now, was there some of this going on before at Berkeley? Of course there was. Does some of this, you know, outside use of unutilized instruments happen at other great research universes? Of course it does. And MP3s existed when Apple created an iTunes store. It's sort of like, what if we took this seriously? All right. So that was a terrific one. And it was so successful that it's just much better than it used to be. We actually spun out a company based on this. I don't need to go into that now, but we launched a company that's going to bring a service and stack and a user interface and outbound marketing on top of what we'd already done at Berkeley to other universities to make this work. So from that pilot, that experiment, we got some uh, terrific outcomes. Experimentation, that is key. I think nobody should get away from that fundamental first principles thinking, I think, is what ties into it. A related question, you're talking about universities. I want to touch upon the ecosystem dynamics. An ecosystem comprised of various stakeholders, especially at law school like ours, including the students, faculty, alumni, and the community partners. Can you talk about how the interplay and collaboration between these different stakeholders evolved over years? And was there any intentionality or was it all organic? In terms of growing that ecosystem. Yeah, there's both growth and the cohesion within that growth. So I think part of what we started to realize and part of what this 2018 report, which I had no part in, this was that faculty report on entrepreneurship at Berkeley. Part of what we realized is, well, this would be true at most great research universities, we develop as a thousand flowers bloom. I like to describe it as federated creativity or distributed creativity. It's just the way Berkeley works. It's the way a lot of universities work. But how do we make it add up to more than the sum of the parts? That's kind of the way I describe my position. So one of the things that we wanted to do, I'll give you one example. And this predated me. It wasn't my idea. We've tried to make it even more valuable. But we have a council on campus, an innovation and entrepreneurship council. So what is that? All right, you've got all these accelerators and incubators and funding programs and affiliated VC firms and courses and et cetera. When we thought about that, we thought, all right, we've got like executive directors, faculty included, faculty directors and executive directors of whatever, 70 or 80 or 90 different parts of that ecosystem. How do we pull them together in a way that's useful to them? Asking people to go to a meeting that is a waste of time. It's like, no, thank you. We have a meeting. It's once a month. It's the first Wednesday of every month. And we do everything we can to make that meeting as valuable as possible. And people show up. And you talked about intentionality. When somebody doesn't show up for two or three months, I email them. And I say, no problem. Looks like this isn't working for you anymore. But we're going to take you off this list of council members. In other words, we're enforcing a norm. I don't say it quite that baldly, but it's kind of like that. Now, what makes it valuable? Last comment here. Part of what makes it value, we do master classes. So whether it's you, Naresh, or anybody else, it's sort of like, what is Naresh's superpower topic? What is something that everybody in that room on that council would like to hear Naresh talk about for eight to 10 minutes? And everybody on that council has like a superpower topic. So every meeting has one, sometimes two of these wonderful master classes. And people find it really valuable. That's part of why they tune in. And now they're talking to each other. They're talking to each other. Hey, we're thinking about launching this. Oh, we should talk and make sure that we're not overlapping and duplicating. And so that has proven to be some glue that we were missing. Great insights there. I think going down that thread, one in inevitable topic is the talent pipeline. One of the key aspects of ecosystem evolution is the talent pipeline. 
And UC Berkeley is known for producing all kinds of top talents. I'm trying to understand how has the university's approach to nurture and channel this talent into entrepreneurial pursuits changed over time? Are there any specifics that others can benefit from? That'll be very helpful. This is a big topic. I'll just give two concrete examples. I think there are many examples, and most any university would have many examples of this. But example number one, dual degree programs. We launched a dual undergraduate degree, business plus engineering. You get to Berkeley, you're in both programs. Historically, that wasn't true about business. Historically, you entered Berkeley as an engineering student, but you applied to the business major as a sophomore to get in as a junior. You didn't get in as a freshman. This is a program where, as long as you do the work, you get both degrees. You have a Bachelor of Science in Engineering and a Bachelor of Science Mm -hmm. in Business. It's coding both fields in your brain at 18, 19, 20, et cetera. And that's a real integration, as opposed to being an undergrad engineer and five years later getting an MBA. Those are still two distinct domains, we think, cognitively and practically. And we launched another one that was life sciences plus business. These are just some examples. There are many others, but a couple of ones I've been more involved in. So both degrees, like molecular and cell biology and business, uh, you leave birth. So dual degrees are what I'll call cross-training or dual credentialing type programs. We've done a lot with that. So have other universities. The second one that I would mention is, look, if we're going to be inclusive about this, let's be honest with ourselves. Words like founder, entrepreneur, venture, these are not inclusive words. They're just a lot of 18, 19, 20, or any year olds. They don't see themselves in those words. So if we say we want everybody to have a slice of the entrepreneurial pie, it's like, well, okay, great. This is for all. It's for everyone. Okay. But you could add five more sections of entrepreneurship and people won't take them. So how do you come up with a narrative that is inviting to everybody? We came up with a narrative at Berkeley that is effectively a narrative. It's a wider, more inclusive way to teach entrepreneurial thinking. I'll say that again, a wider, more inclusive way to teach entrepreneurial thinking. And the program is called The Berkeley Changemaker, the Berkeley Changemaker program. We're not the first to use the word changemaker, but you put the word Berkeley in front of the word changemaker. In fact, we have a registered trademark for that two-word phrase, and it sings. Well, look, does it sing? It sounds like it sings. It's like, what happened? Well, we launched a course called The Berkeley Changemaker in 2020, and over 500 students showed up. So it exploded. Now we have over 30 courses in the Berkeley Changemaker program. And they're coming from classics and sociology and all over the campus. They're also a more diverse mix. They're more women. They're more first-gen students. They're more underrepresented groups. So it really is, in the data, more inclusive, much more inclusive than our entrepreneurship classes are. You need to find narratives that speak to the wit that you're trying to speak to. Those are great initiatives. Read a lot about that. And speak up inclusive. Let's talk about the grad students and the postdocs who are basically the workhorses of research engines at universities and, and there's a faculty. How do you be inclusive of those sections? Well, I think we still have headroom. I don't want to make it sound like we've nailed this. I think all universities are trying to do more about this. For postdocs like yourself, many of them come to Berkeley. It's like, I'm still gunning for that very best academic job. I mean, that's what they're gunning for. And that's what they want. So if you say, well, there's all this stuff going on in innovation and entrepreneurship, that student would likely say, I'm focused on getting that academic job. And that's just fine, of course. But part of it is creating optionality. It's mm-hmm. like, we're not trying to distract you, but you might go to an event or two. You might just have a look because having options, depending upon how things play out, it's just kind of hard to get exactly that academic job you've always wanted. And there are an awful lot of opportunities, especially among science PhDs, but but much more broadly than just science PhDs, the humanists and the social scientists as well, ways to get connected to innovation and entrepreneurship. So we've tried with your help and many other people, but like the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneurship Program, you've pioneered it. It's sort of like, how do we create an affinity group and some programming around it to help postdocs or those that want to, it's not required, get introduced to some of the opportunities here. And we're trying to do more of that with our doctoral students as well. It's work in progress, for sure. I talk to other universities. It doesn't matter if it is MIT or Stanford or Harvard. They still have that challenge. And plugging that optionality into their brains is something nobody has pioneered yet so far. I hope they'll get there. The other section was faculty. I mean, we have faculty like Jennifer Doudna, who's like, Ripping it with startups, <laughs> uh, rocking the startup world with so many startups and that Carolyn Bertizzi at Stanford, Nobel Laureate again, a lot of startups coming up there. Have you seen 
any influence of such Nobel laureates, like in evolution of other faculty thinking about startups? I'm an economist. You want a direct causal link backed by data? It's kind of the way I think just because of my field. I can't say that. Anecdotally, part of what I love about the Jennifer Doudna story is that she wants to continue doing fundamental research. She's a really good exam, you know, got mammoth biosciences and caribou and all these terrific companies out there. And she's still doing lots of fundamental research. So this idea that, oh, we're losing Jennifer to the intellectual world, it's just not true. And I think that's exciting. And so she attracts postdocs and graduate students that at least are open to some of these opportunities. If you look at the CEOs and C-level people in some of those companies, it's people who came in through the postdoc door or the doctoral student door. So that seems to be working very well. And there are other faculty. Here's an example. If you go to this website, ind.berkeley.edu, another document you will find there is the top 100 faculty founders at Berkeley. Okay, it's like a clickable list. You click, oh, that's what that person does. That went up like six months ago. It's not been up there all day. And I would say this is sort of a culture change indicator or litmus test. If we had put that up 10 years ago, we would have got calls from faculty saying, take my name. (laughs) I'm a scholar first. Okay, yes, I'm a founder, but I'm a scholar first. I don't want my reputation linked to this guy. Nobody has said, take me down on that list. Not a single person. And some have asked, why aren't I on that list? That's an indicator of culture change. But anyway, I think we are celebrating. That's the key word. We are celebrating our faculty founders in ways that we never have in the past. You and I think them. that's part of what's making the change happen. That's a very important point. I think faculty used to be advisors to companies back in the day. And like a lot of it was like not talked about much. I think that collaboration is important. And I'm glad we are celebrating that collaboration so that it will all benefit the society at the end of the day. Yeah. If I could just add one thing too, Berkeley, like other universities, we have conflict of commitment policies. If somebody says, come on, Rich, it's so Pollyannish. It's like these faculty are starting to spend way too much time on this. They're taking C-level jobs. They've still got their tenured position. This is a problem. And I would say to them, you are right. In cases where people go too far and they're crossing conflict of commitment lines that are very clear on this campus, then that's too far. The idea that let's just go, people, there's no problem here. It's sort of like, no, we have to take conflict of commitment seriously. And we do. So I just don't want anybody to hear this as, wow, I mean, where are you thinking that this university should go? We need to make sure that our scholars are doing scholarship and are doing great teaching, et cetera. And we do our best to ensure that. Absolutely important. I'd like to slightly shift gears and talk about failure and resilience. And I don't think it's all success stories all over at, at any point. It's an integral part of entrepreneurial journey. And do any particular failures come to mind when it comes to building this ecosystem? And how has Berkeley's approach to addressing and learning from the failures evolved? Yeah, well, this is an important question. And when people say fail fast or fail small, I can't think of any really big failures. So when I answer this question, it's more kind of these experiments, hopefully where you haven't bet the house, you're running some experiments and you're trying to see how things are going. Well, here's one very recent. It's a small failure. But we kind of had this big idea, and then we thought, oh, it's not working. We have over 10 incubators and accelerators on campus. We have a list, that website I mentioned before, ine.berkeley.edu. It's the top 10 sources of new ventures coming out of Berkeley. These are the accelerators and incubators. Now, each of them has a pitch event, a demo day. And we thought, well, if we could just coordinate the timing, we could have like demo week. We could have like innovation week. We could invite alums to Berkeley and they could plug into the blockchain accelerator and the clean tech accelerator and Skydeck and launch and all this stuff. And they'd see what's going on at the Stargy Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology and Engineering and so forth. And it would just be like, yeah, come for a day, two days, three days. It's sort of like South by Southwest. Check this out. Because there would be so much you could present. Well, when you get down into the guts of the programs, it's sort of like, no, this is like a course. And we have to do it in the last week of the course. And Skydeck has its own time frame and so forth. The more we tried to coordinate it, the more we started to realize, ah, cool idea. But they're just these structural frictions that are going to make it hard in the short run. And so 
I'll call that a failure. I felt like it could be really, really cool. And maybe we'll get there. But thus far, we haven't figured it out. That's funny. Coordination is hard. I know one of the incidents in the Bay Area, like where the JP Morgan healthcare conference happens every January. And there are other groups that try to like have an event right after that when people are just brained and like it's hard to really stay for that long. I think we just learn. I just wanted to stick to the subject of failures more because if there are any lessons that others can learn, if there are any unique challenges or obstacles that Berkeley had faced in building the startup ecosystem as we continue to do that, that others may not encounter or may be hard to overcome for the other universities. Anything well, comes to mind? You mentioned culture. For a lot of people, that's kind of a squishy topic, but you do get pushback on various things. I'll give you a concrete example. There's a donor that was saying, I'd be interested in creating a new PhD program in translational science. Sort of like, interesting. Let's pull some deans together and talk about this. Well, we pulled some deans together without the donor on the call. And for most of the deans, it's like, we do PhD programs in disciplines like chemistry and engineering and physics. Translational science isn't a discipline. So first of all, what's the core content there? And it could be multidisciplinary, right? Nobody was saying we don't have any multidisciplinary programs. But when you get to the PhD level, wide angle multidisciplinarity is very rare. You need to be deep going into those academic job markets. So then we started talking about, well, you, Doug Clark, College of Chemistry, what kind of translational stuff are you already doing? And he starts describing what he's doing, and it blows us away. Now, we're all fellow deans and fellow members of this ecosystem, and we couldn't believe all the stuff that he was describing. And then internships for their doctoral students in industry, so they get a sense for what's going on out there and so forth. And then we heard from the College of Engineering, we heard from biological sciences. Long story short, the list of already sort of translation advancing educational opportunities and programmatic opportunities for our PhD students was remarkable. And none of us knew it. We created a document called Translational Science at Berkeley. And we distributed it back to the deans. It was like just inventory what you heard on the call, plus a little bit more. And this is kind of the failure part, not failure, but resistance. We started to distribute that and people started saying, what about fundamental research? What are we doing? There's no mention of fundamental research in this document. People started legitimately getting worried that it's like, is Berkeley just running down the path of translational programming and research? This document was just focusing on translational research because we didn't know all that was going on. But anyways, so that was a little communication error or failure. It's sort of like, you really still need a line at the top of a document like that that says, the seat of Berkeley's preeminence is fundamental research. Line number one. Now, we're going to talk about translational research. <laughs> but when you don't do that, some people react pretty strongly. Yeah. <laughs> I've been in academia for a couple of decades now, I think. You know, oh my God, I've been here too long. It's not unique to Berkeley. I see this across the board. And maybe an interesting topic to talk about is ethical consideration. Yes. As the startup ecosystem continues to evolve, what measures are being taken to address ethical considerations and ensure that innovation aligns with societal values and goals? You brought up uh, gene editing. You know, we have the AI, for instance, where Berkeley is actually a leader at the 30,000 feet level. Like, what are we doing at Berkeley to address those ethical considerations? There need to be many, many things. There's no one answer to this. And I'm sure other universities are doing a lot of stuff we could learn from as well. But a couple of examples. Stuart Russell is a faculty member and he's kind of written the textbook. I think it's the most used textbook to teach artificial intelligence. Anyway, Stuart Russell, very well known. And he's given a lot of talks that basically are warning about the dangers of AI if we aren't being intentional going into it. And so some people would call him, he's on the doom side of the debate. But I view it more as, look, we need to be really clear. Well, think about it as yes, if. He's telling us some of these if conditions, and there are some of them that I haven't thought about, and maybe some other people haven't thought about. And how do we address them if they are real, whether it's regulation or how we teach our PhDs or whatever it is? So getting that content out to people, he's given many, many talks on campus. That's just one concrete example. But the people that are thinking hard, again, I'll use the nomenclature about these if conditions, is really, really helpful, I think. The other part of it is... Berkeley's a public institution. 
When you think about the top, top research universities, at least in this country, most people's top 10 list would be almost exclusively private, if not exclusively private, other than Berkeley. And Berkeley does have different values. A lot of our faculty and staff and students are here because its publicness means something. And so when we talk about values that help to define Berkeley, one of the ones we talk about is beyond yourself, a sense of stewardship for something larger. Now, are there a lot of beyond yourself people at private universities? Of course there are, but we are public. We are aiming at educating many more people than these private institutions do. And in the way that we think about that public mission and commitment, a sense of stewardship for something larger is in almost everything we do. And so people could talk about the social impact, the greater good. These things are woven into everydayness at Berkeley. And you really feel it. And people who are at some of these other institutions say, I feel it less there. People who actually sampled both. So that's sort of what's in the water, what's in the air, what's in the culture, what are the norms? And I think that's actually very helpful for steering the ship. Well, a lot of important points there. And one thing that stuck is impact, the social and the global impact. Our research obviously has an impact around the world. I'm trying to understand, like, what would you say the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem is? How is it important to Berkeley versus being important to how we deliver our mission to the world, to the larger society? What's the discussion that is happening around that at Berkeley? And how do you balance those? It's an important discussion. You know, I think it is going on. It's one that becoming the next chancellor, I'm going to be very involved in and hope to provide some leadership on. Here's one way I think about it. Whether we're thinking about the University of California or we're thinking about Berkeley more specifically, I believe, and I think virtually everybody believes this, that Berkeley is one of society's most important assets. We could debate that. You could say, well, every great university, but Berkeley's public. Berkeley's public. These other great universities, at least in this country, are mostly not. So it occupies it. I'm going to call it a singular place. It plays a very important role in setting an example. And if it does things right, it can be a bellwether. It can be a positive example or, or exemplar. And I think that's part of when I think about sort of Berkeley's impact on the world, innovation and entrepreneurship seem a little different. Like just as a few examples, it's sort of like research, teaching, and service. If somebody says that's the mission, then you would look at innovation and entrepreneurship and you'd say, innovation and entrepreneurship, that's on the periphery. That's distracting. That's out there. If instead you say the mission, the deep why is impact, long-term societal benefit, then innovation and entrepreneurship is right at the core of the mission, among other things, but it's not at the periphery. All right. So what role can Berkeley play, not just in generating more technology and helping society by doing that, but also can we lead by helping to frame how valuable this part of this universe, if, if Berkeley is one of society's most important assets, to what use shall we put it? And I feel like this isn't the only use, of course, but this feels like a very important use to step up our intentionality around over the next couple of decades. I think that is actually a nice segue to talk about parts of the startup and innovation ecosystem at UC Berkeley that can be replicable by other universities. Do you know of any initiatives that you believe are relatively straightforward that others could use? I do. I mean, most universities, great research universities, have incubators and accelerators and that sort of thing is already there. But like I mentioned earlier, this research infrastructure commons, it opens the boundary of the university. It allows private firms to actually utilize underutilized equipment like cell sorters and sequencers and, and mass spectrometers and so forth. That's really interesting. And I think that is something any university could engage in. The contracts that we use, it's like, what does the contract look like? What are the counterparties agreeing to? It's like we posted contracts and things like that on our website. So if you just search Berkeley Research Infrastructure Commons, there's an FAQ on there and contract templates and things like that. It's like, it's, anyways, so that's something that it feels like every research university could engage more in. Now, some would say, we don't want to do a lot of that, but we're happy. Okay, that's a big one. And then second one is, how do you bring funding in fresh ways to the universe? And like every research university, there are lots of venture capital firms, or not just venture capital funding, but angel investors or friends and family or any source of capital. 
And we do our best to make sure that we're appealing to them. But how do we bring an extra layer of intentionality? So one of the things that I will mention that we developed here at Berkeley is relationships with a small subset, happens to be eight currently, a small subset of funds that actually share their returns back to the university. They get to use the university's trademarks and other things to raise funds from limited partners. And the general partner in each of these eight cases, the GP, contractually commits half of their carry, half of their return back to Berkeley. It's like, oh, that's really interesting. We have information about these funds on our website. It's also at ine.berkeley.edu. But that scenario where it's like, yeah, that's fascinating because it creates a feedback loop into the financial model of the university. And that's something that we're getting calls from a lot of universities within the UC system, but even beyond that are saying, how did you set that up? What do those contracts look like? How do we do this? And we've put a lot of that information on the website as well. You brought up an important point in there about incubator and accelerators. Where do dedicated entrepreneurship courses fall in this whole spectrum? Because, you know, if you look at just Berkeley, right? Skydeck, Berkeley's largest startup incubator, happened only about 10, 12 years ago. And there was a small QB3 garage before that. I'm trying to get any advice on what could others do in setting up effective versions of these. There must be some lessons learned as you build this ecosystem. The courses are important. Here I want to flag what we call SCET, the Sutarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. So that's a unit within engineering that is incredibly open system in the way that it operates. So it really invites undergraduates from lots of different parts of campus into its courses in entrepreneurship of various kinds. At the undergraduate level, it's sort of like this open architecture, as I mentioned, that is super helpful to students. So getting a first course under one's belt that they can connect with, there's a lot there. You know, some students, they access this whole ecosystem of opportunities through a course. They try a course. For others, it's like they join a club and they learn from peers what the peers are doing, and then they take a course. Or for some, they happen to know some people that are starting a company and they kind of get thrust into an, an incubator or an accelerator and they haven't even taken a course and they realize, I need to learn how venture capital works. I need to learn some of this other stuff. So there's so many different pathways through it, but the courses is an important element for almost everybody somewhere along that pathway. Yeah, core courses are important. You brought up a couple of important things. That's why I'm smiling. I know a startup that came out of Berkeley, Nilumbo. An undergrad who was just working with two postdoc in there, happened to spend some time with the founders at the startup for a summer, and he never went back to school and ended up becoming the CEO of the startup. I just want to connect that back to something you mentioned about internships. I think engineering students are known for going out for internships at the PhD level and postdoc level, but not many in the sciences and the humanities. Are there anything that people could be doing because it's like frowned upon? stop your PhD program and go away for like a few weeks for an internship program. Any thoughts on that subject? I think that has not been challenged. And I think we need a leader like you <laughs> to change and ask yes, if kind of questions. Well, I mentioned earlier briefly chemistry. To win the PhD students they wanted to win, increasingly they needed to offer an internship for PhD students. And that game is changing. I'm an economist. We talk about demand side and supply side. It's sort of like the demand side is saying, if you want me to get a PhD at Berkeley, you better have something like this. That's demand driven, as we say. And we're seeing that. We just, our Baker Bioingenuity Hub, which is a science incubator, science space, it's got a lot of special properties and lots of companies in there, like 30 different companies. And we just got an exemption, an approval under certain conditions for graduate students to be interns in there. And why do we need approvals and so forth? That's a space called the Baker Bioingenuity Hub, B-A-K-A-R, where the companies that are in there, I mentioned there are about 30 of them, own all of the IP. Well, now you have to be careful. A PhD student who's been working in a campus lab where all the IP is owned by the university walks across the street into Baker Bioingenuity Hub and starts effectively transferring potentially IP to a company that owns all the IP that they file for. You got to make sure there are guardrails so that you can get that done. And so that wasn't an easy problem to solve, but we solved that problem. And now we have graduate student, doctoral student interns that are part of the Baker Bioingenuity Hub. Last example, at the undergrad level, 
Skydeck started something called the ACE program, A-C-E, Accelerating Careers in Entrepreneurship. And these were internship opportunities, many of them unpaid, internship opportunities in companies at Skydeck. At any given time, there are 150-ish companies at Skydeck. So I was at Caroline Winnett as a direct report of mine. She runs Skydeck. I was asking Caroline this probably a year ago now. How many student interns, undergraduate student interns, do you place each year? I thought she'd say 30, 50. I didn't know the number. She said 800. 800. They have these information sessions for undergraduates. Might you want to be an intern in a startup? 1,500 students show up. They do three of these a year, and it's like 500 each time. And they're placing like half of those. So the scale of the demand side on the undergraduate internship side of things is just phenomenal. So that is something I think a lot of other universities could benefit from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like you brought up undergrads, like I have to plug in this one. So I run a program called the Berkeley Science Fellows Program, where we recruit postdocs to work with deep tech startups, where they're providing their skills, they're learning about startups, but it's been a two-way bridge. We run into that challenge of that culture change needs to happen at the faculty level, at the university administration level. I hope we can see an acceleration on that front. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum about parts that are hard to replicate. What aspects of Berkeley startup ecosystem do you believe are truly unique and difficult for other institutions to replicate? Well, I want to be clear-eyed about my answer. I tend to be a little Pollyannish and I get excited about things and sometimes I don't realize they aren't so transferable. But Berkeley's a big university, right? We've got 30, close to 35,000 undergraduates. There are some bigger universities, publics, but privates are running at 20 to 25 percent the undergraduate scale. So they're much, much smaller. But that comprehensiveness, that size really does give us, you know, it's wide and deep. That's kind of one of the things that I say. It's really wide and deep. So we can have a clean tech accelerator. We can have a blockchain accelerator. We can have all these accelerators and sort of like, don't they step on each other's feet? It's like, it's a big enough place to have all these different partitions in the way we think about our ecosystem. That's not going to be true at a smaller private university or a smaller university. It's just much too concentrated. That would be one element. I think the other thing is, I mentioned tone from the top as one of the levers, Paul Alibasados and something and things like that. It's sort of like, look, if the tone from the top isn't there, if you don't have receptivity from your president or from your board, people feel like, we are a research university first, and this stuff is not where we want to take things, then it's just going to be very hard to climb that hill without winning some hearts and minds first. And so that's like a precondition for creating momentum. You absolutely need that. And so if it's not there, then it's sort of like, what does that mean, winning the hearts and minds? Well, it's sort of like, how do you make the case? How do you make the case that it's mission relevant? You can just have a debate, for example, not that that will solve it, but it's sort of like, it's mission relevant. Here's why, okay? It brings in financial resources that fund the core of this university. That's distinct from mission relevant, but that's important. It helps us win graduate students. I use that example. Coming up with value propositions that people aren't seeing, and then they still might end up saying, I don't want to take this university in that direction. But if you show five or six or seven channels of value that they hadn't thought about, I think you can open some people's minds. But that's a necessary condition. I want to talk about the sustainability and scalability of this ecosystem we have built at Berkeley. As the startup ecosystem continues to grow, how does Berkeley plan to maintain its momentum and ensure some scalability and sustainability? Maybe if you have any specific measures that are being taken, keep this going on. Those are related words, but pretty distinct when we think about sustainability in society more generally and how we contribute to it. If somebody said, let's take climate change as one specific example of a, a sustainability challenge, a major one facing obviously all of us and the whole globe, it's like I use the phrase, if Berkeley is one of society's most important assets or any of our universities is, to what use will we put it? If somebody said, we're going to put Berkeley to maximum use in order to address, hopefully greatly mitigate climate change, and then that person says, but we want to do that in a way that's orthogonal to innovation and entrepreneurship, ah, like there's nothing there. Here's my definition of innovation. Maybe I should have started here. New ideas put into practice. New ideas put into practice. 
So discovery and invention are not the same as innovation. They are not by themselves put into practice. Mm -hmm. Now notice, new ideas put into practice. There was no mention of science there. So the humanities and the social sciences are very much included in that definition. All right. So ultimately, yeah, we have a lot of fundamental research to do to mitigate, hopefully reverse, climate change. So I'm not saying fundamental, but innovation and entrepreneurship and how we put it into practice. We don't have to do it. We want to understand how the fundamental research that we are doing is more likely to be put into practice. All right. So that's kind of a, a sustainability point, a very narrow one, but I think hopefully a helpful one. Scalability was the other piece of it. And I think some of that, look, I don't think they would have chosen me as the next chancellor if whoever makes these decisions, right? Ultimately, it's the president of the UC system with the support of the regents, but it's an endogenous outcome. There's lots of feedback that comes in. Because I think a lot of people feel like, no, we have more headroom in this direction. I mean, it's not the only thing I do, of course, and it's not the only thing I'm going to focus on as chancellor. But I think people are basically saying we still have opportunity as Berkeley in this area. And so I think that bodes well for scalability. It doesn't mean that maximal scale is the right scale. We have to think hard about what parts of what we're doing are maybe already kind of optimized in terms of their scale and where we still have some nice headroom to grow. Lots of food for thought there. I consider very, myself very lucky to be able to talk to leaders like you. I, mean, I don't think most people get this opportunity. And thank you for your time. And before we close, are there any topics that we haven't covered that we should have talked about? I really like the list of topics that you did bring up. The only thing that I would mention is people tend to link what we've just talked about to the private sector and putting into practice being a commercial mechanism. But innovation and entrepreneurship are very relevant in the civic sector, nonprofits or non-governmental organizations are very important in the public sector. And they're very important to the humanities or the humanities are very important to innovation and entrepreneurship, especially going forward, as well as the social sciences. So we talked a lot about science and we talked about de facto a lot about commercialization in the public sector, but that wide angle is important. I know it was implicit in many of your questions, but I guess I would close on that. Let's keep the aperture wide. We need our humanists and our social scientists engaged and we need to improve the civic sector and public sector at the same time. Excellent, Rich. This has been fun. I definitely learned a lot. I'm hoping this will send a lot of lessons to other people who are willing to learn or looking for lessons. But thank you so much for your time. Good luck with your new role. I'm sure you'll do great as the next chancellor for UC Berkeley. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naresh. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Lab to Startup podcast. You can find links to the resources and programs mentioned in these episodes, connect with Naresh, or subscribe to this show at labtostartup.com. <laughs>